joy to be able to interview Trevor Merrill. Today we've had the privilege of spending uh, the morning with you. Trevor is the collaborator of uh, Psychopolitics, the, the book that we'll be discussing in a bit more detail shortly. Also the manager of imitatia.org. Um, I think if we can begin, I, I, I so enjoyed the way in which your story unfolded, how you discovered Gerardian thinking and um, how that has influenced your life up to now. Maybe we can start there and see if we get to the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think that one of the interesting things about Girardian theory is that somehow the way that you come to it is always very important. Mm. So when two people who have an interest in these ideas get together, one of the first things they usually talk about is, how did you discover these ideas? And I think maybe one of the reasons for that is that these ideas uh, tend to have a profound effect on the people who discover them. Mm -hmm. So there's a before and an after. Yes. So that moment of discovery is very important. Yes. You know, and it tends to, it tends to be uh, you sort of remember where you were when yeah. you first read, you know, <laughs> things wow. hidden since the foundation of the world, the seek desire. So true. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was in Paris, which is a good place mm -hmm. to discover <laughs> René Girard. Yeah. And uh, I was reading a wonderful essay by Milan Kundera uh, called Testaments Betrayed. And there was a footnote in this essay uh, in which Kundera said, Deceit, Desire, in the Novel is the best book I've ever read about mm. the art of the novel. Yes. And I was, a, and still I was and still am, a, a profound admirer of Kundera's novels. Mm. And so I was induced medically yes. to rush to the bookstore and uh, find this book, which I did, and once I'd read it, uh, I went on to read the rest of Gerard's books, and it, yes. it, uh, it changed the direction of my life. Wow. Wow. I, I remember for us as well, the journey kind of began, I would say, what was it, five years ago, yeah. that we first read some of Gerard's work. And yes, in the beginning, it kind of was a very useful tool to invert some of our ideas to, to kind of uh, totally inverse some of our theologies but what I realized after a while is these ideas were inverting me. I, I, I was in a way suddenly becoming aware of the, the processes that forms my sense of self and that kind of reformatting of your very self-awareness was, was profoundly influential in our lives going forward. And so you don't just become aware of how it transforms you, but suddenly you, you see it in all relationships. And maybe what we should do just to give the, some of the viewers who, who might not understand uh, Gerardian thinking and mimetic theory yet, I've often struggled to try and summarize what it is in five minutes, but I'm going to throw you in the deep end and say, can you summarize the triangularity of desire and how it affects cultural development in, in five minutes? <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Well, I mean, I think that an author that we admire Jean-Michel Aubrillion said something very interesting that can illuminate what Girard is talking about when he talks about mimetic desire. He says, uh, Jean-Michel Aubrillion is a psychiatrist uh, who has applied Girardian ideas to his practice. And he says that in his practice he never sees what Girard calls mimetic desire directly. He never sees imitation directly, and imitation is at the very heart of what Girard is talking about. What he sees are people fighting with each other. Yes. And they come into his office and they say, we have a problem, we're fighting. Or one person comes into his office and says, I have a problem, uh, my boyfriend is annoying me, or my boss is uh, out to get me, or whatever. Yes. And uh, what Jean-Michel Ugurlion says is that this fighting, this rivalry, is actually the manifestation 
of what Girard calls mimetic desire. So yes. why would that be? Why would uh, rivalry, fighting, uh, have anything to do with mimesis, mm. mimetic mm. desire? Well, what Girard says is that we want what other people want. Mm -hmm. And that means our desires converge on the same object, on the same non-object, power, so forth. And uh, this quickly leads to conflict. Mm. And we see conflict all around us. Yes. Now, this means that human relationships are always in danger of descending into this conflict as a result of our tendency to want what everybody else wants. Yeah. Um, now, how is this related to cultural development? That's a very big question. Mm. But uh, one way of thinking about it is to ask ourselves, well, how come, even though we see conflict all around us, how come so much of the time we don't see conflict? How come there's so much peace in the world? Where does that come from? Now, one explanation is that human beings are just basically nice, gentle uh, sorts of creatures, and uh, when we fight, it's merely a kind of unfortunate accident. But of course, Girard, without being entirely pessimistic, is going to be a little bit more pessimistic than that. And he's going to say, uh, we don't resolve our quarrels by having rational conversations and working things out. Uh, we actually, from time immemorial, have only had one solution to the problem of the conflict, which is to blame it on somebody else. Mm. And in expelling them, uh, yeah. expel all of our problems. Yes. And, and that's how we've dealt with, with yeah. things. Yeah. Until, and this is where your book, Desire Found Me, comes in, mm. uh, something uh, incredible happened in human history, which yeah. is the uh, the story of Israel and the story of Christianity yeah. and the biblical revelation. Yeah, wow. Which opens up the very core of what is it that initially stirs up desire um, and whether that desire is, desire is going to become rivalistic or whether it's going to become a desire that actually creates an opportunity for relationship. And I think at the core of what the, the the scripture starts unveiling is that humanity either begins with a sense of inadequacy which we see in Genesis 3 uh, the suggestion is made you lack being and when we have begin life with a sense of lack not I, I think Genesis 3 is probably not just meant to be a, an historic account of human origins but in a way it is the psychological origin of every human being that somewhere in our development the suggestion is made that you lack being and and it is that sense of lack that often causes us to look at others to tell us what do i desire what we actually desire is their being but if we can't have their being the next best, best thing is to have what they want <laughs> that kind of gives us access to their being. And that rivalry begins out of that, that sense of inadequacy, which I think we, we might even get to that today, but probably not. Obviously, Jesus completely inverses that story and introduces us to the possibility that what you are is sufficient. But instead of a humanity trying to attain greater divinity or more, more being, Jesus introduces us to a God who becomes man, <laughs> who invests himself into humanity because he sees such value and beauty there. What, what so fascinated me with the psychopolitics book, specifically because we've got this course in which we have conversations with a whole group of other people who's going through this conversation of what does mimetic theory mean to my relationship, to my community, to my society, is that the same kind of relationships that we and movements of desire that we see within individual relationships seem to be evident on a much larger scale in politics as well. And um, maybe you can help us understand that a bit further. Well, this brings to mind uh, for me this story that Milan Kundera, to go back to Milan Kundera, tells in one of his novels about uh, a Czech woman 
who very courageously refused to cave in to the pressure that the secret police were putting on her when they interrogated her. Uh, I think she was imprisoned. Uh, but ultimately, uh, she never acknowledged her own guilt. And so they never got anything on her. And because of her courage, she ended up being released. Now, she had a son. And Kundera relates that sometime after her release, he was at their house. And the son came down for breakfast or something. And suddenly, the woman started to give him a really hard time about the fact that he hadn't made his bed, putting all kinds of guilt on him for this. And he was astonished to realize that the historical process of uh, interrogation and guilt inducement that she had survived so courageously, she was now repeating on a small personal scale, so that it was as if the personal and the political were intertwined and were mirrors of each other. Yeah. Uh, now, I think uh, the, you know, there are many other authors who provide insights into this. Kafka, Kafka for one, you know, he writes about totalitarian structures before they even came into existence. Yeah. Uh, but he also writes about the relationship between sons and fathers, for example. And somehow those two things are mirrors of each other. Now, I think Jean-Michel's uh, you know, idea uh, is that uh, this mirroring of the personal and the, and the political uh, not only works in these somewhat narrow or limited examples, but it works on the whole theater of international relations, so yes. that you can look at the relationship among nations or states as being analogous to, indeed identical to, controlled by, guided by, governed by the same laws yes. that the relationships of individuals are governed yeah. by. Yeah, and so, I mean, I, the, the one scripture just, that just bounces up while you, talking is in James, I think it's James 3, first few verses, it says, why are there conflicts amongst you? Why are there wars? Why is there so much violence? Is it not because you desire, but your desire is never fulfilled? Um, that it is that perversion of desire that gives rise to these conflicts. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating in, in that thinking that the same kind of psychological processes that works on individual basis works on a national basis as well, that jealousies are created, nations try to attain to the same kind of possessions, the same kind of desires, and, and, but there's only so much resources. And so conflict seems inevitable. What Gerard made us aware of is this whole process of profane violence where, we, where it's just a war of all against all, where we just go after what we want and kill whoever stands in the way. That, that problem was solved originally by a new kind of violence, sacred violence, where instead of everyone killing everyone, uh, we find the one scapegoat that you spoke about. We find the one person, the one minority, the one nation to blame. And that kind of diverts our atten uh, attention from just wanting to destroy anything to get what we want to, to containing our violence and containing our frustration. But if Jesus actually exposed sacred violence for what it is, that that it is still unjust, that it is still, that, that the victim is innocent. Um, how, why, why does violence seem to still be the way in which nations want to solve their problems? Has the revelation not permeated? Or what do you think is happening there? Well, so, I think that Girard has shown us that the passion of the Christ is the revelation and, in some sense, the undermining yeah. of this universal mechanism of scapegoat. But what he also shows us is that that revelation and that undermining are not a formula for peace. And he mm -hmm. keeps pointing to the, the famous yeah. scripture, uh, I 
I'm not bringing peace. Yes. You're mistaken if you think I'm bringing peace. I'm actually yes. going to bring a sword, and all of you are going to start fighting with one another because of me. Yeah. So why would that be? Well, the scapegoat mechanism hasn't disappeared from our world. Mm -hmm. uh, on a personal level, if we have a little bit of a problem or a tension between us, we'll know instinctively that if we can make fun of somebody who isn't there, yes. we're, we'll be able to laugh together yes. and enjoy a feeling of complicity. Yeah. Um, on the international level, uh, you know, there are all of these uh, complex alliances among nation states, uh, but uh, the concept of the coalition is very mm -hmm. important in our world, right? Mm -hmm. In order to justify an act of hostility against a particular nation, you always need a coalition. Yes. Um, but sometimes it's uh, the, uh, the, the, the target of that uh, converging hostility that is in fact the origin of that coalition. Yes. So it takes an act of terrorism for the French people to say, we are Americans, for example, mm. and for the Americans to say, after the attacks in Paris, we are French. Yes. And then we all feel like we're on the same page. Yeah. Now, the difference between this kind of alliance mm. and the sort of scapegoating that Girard hypothesizes in archaic religion is that it's no longer created. It doesn't produce any any new law it doesn't produce yeah. any new culture it doesn't produce any new difference and so uh, the effect happens it makes us feel good for a short time we we you know we feel better but yeah. then very quickly it wears off and we yes. need a new victim yes. uh, yes. to settle our differences yeah for me that's amazing that if Jesus did unveil that our scapegoating mechanism uh, 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 if he did expose it for what it is and it is no longer effective then the only alternatives is we're going to go back to the profane violence the pagan violence in which it's a war of all against all because the very mechanism that contained violence is now exposed for the the, the inconsistencies it contained the untruths it contains for instance our victims are not always guilty. For instance, the, the, the agreement that we have that somebody else is guilty, we, we've become very suspicious of that kind of agreements and coalitions. And to an extent, that's maybe why so many of the wars have not been very satisfactory. Because there's, we are no longer able to so clearly identify a victim and convince everyone that they are undoubtedly guilty. It's as if the revelation brought by Christ has made people more and more aware of the innocence of our victims and more and more suspicious of every act of violence that this might be again an act of violence against God himself instead of a justified act of violence. Um, so, I think that uh, we, I did a quick post before we did this interview and I asked some friends, what questions would you want me to ask Trevor? <laughs> and one of, one of the questions that came out is, is there any other way then to, to bring about unity, to have a sense of national unity without violence? What, what are the alternatives? Well, that's a very big question. Yeah. And I think that if we knew about the alternatives, uh, we would be in a different position than we are right now. Yeah. I think maybe um, we know on some level what the alternative would be. Yeah. A good example might be uh, the example of nuclear deterrence nuclear situation, the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's a wonderful documentary in which a former U.S. Secretary of Defense, yeah. McNamara, talks about how Kennedy sent two messages to Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the question was, uh, who, which message uh, was Khrushchev going to respond to? Was he going to respond to the more assertive message or the more common appeasing message. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately for all of us, uh, he, you know, the thing worked out, but we were very fortunate. And I think that, you know, we have the sense that the only way 
to unravel this kind of terrifying apocalyptic uh, nuclear brinkmanship mm -hmm. is uh, to transform very fundamentally mm -hmm a way of relating to one another. Yes. Uh, but are we really willing to go all the way through with it? Yes. I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. And I think that's why, even though we recognize yeah. uh, the terrible danger that these nuclear weapons represent, for yes. example, we continue to create them, to stockpile yes. them. Uh, and even as we make gestures towards disarmament, with one hand, with the other hand, uh, yeah. we're increasing our stockpiles. Yes. It's a very ambivalent situation. Yeah. Now, I think what, what we've become so aware of is uh, over the past year, we've spent so much time in the USA, and I don't know whether you want to comment on current political um, issues and how that relates to the book, but I guess what we found quite obvious was within the rhetoric of, of Trump specifically, there is this very confrontational um, posture I think what he's done very well is what many other politicians that have been successful have done very well, and that is to identify the enemy clearly, um, uh, which I think is probably part of his popularity. But, um, but at the same time, when you become aware of these processes of relationship, you cannot but realize that these are the same it's almost like as we go back into the pagan violence where the scapegoat mechanism has now been exposed, it's almost like the lost attempt to again re-establish the power of sacred violence by promising to annihilate our enemies completely and to take out their children and their wives and, and there's something appealing about that because here we've got somebody that identified the enemy clearly, but can can that ever lost? <laughs> I know I don't think it can. I mean, I think the I think the political situation in the United States is is very interesting, and there's some social science research that mm -hmm. came out recently uh, that that is quite interesting. Uh, it's it's the idea of negative partisanship. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 1970s, the uh, two American political parties, Republicans and Democrats were actually very internally diverse compared to the way they are today. We had in the Democratic Party the Southern Democrats, for example, more conservative. Uh, we had Republican presidents like Richard Nixon, who actually, uh, you know, the welfare proposals were, were uh, sort of, you know, not entirely perhaps what the Democrats today would want, but, uh, you know, Title IX, welfare, he was interested in this kind of thing in a way that a Republican presidential candidate today couldn't be. Uh, so there's a sense in which uh, we have uh, a greater internal homogeneity within both political parties today in the United States. And at the same time, interestingly enough, we have an electorate that describes itself as being less attached yes. to its political party than it used to be, yeah. more independent. And yet there are fewer swing voters than there mm -hmm. used to be. Mm -hmm. We have fewer split tickets, mm -hmm. you know? and. The electoral results for Senate elections overlap incredibly well with the electoral results for presidential elections, which means that uh, extremely unpopular politicians can be elected, yes. which is very strange. Now, how do you account for all of these weird data? Mm -hmm. Well, there are a couple of professors, I can't remember their names, who published a paper, and they said, well, look, it's true that people are less attached today than they used to be to their political parties, but they're much, much more wary and, uh, and disgusted with what the other political party is doing than they were 30 years ago. Yes. So even though they feel as if they're more yeah. independent and yes. as if they uh, are less attached to a party politics kind yes. of system, they actually end up voting along party lines more than ever before. Yes. Uh, it's an extremely interesting and paradoxical yeah. thing. And I think it reveals the, the, the fact that uh, our political landscape is not dominated by positive convictions and by uh, an attempt to uh, discern what good qualities a politician yeah. might have and that might make him worth voting for, but everything is preceded by a negative, hostile rivalry with the other side that then determines yeah. uh, your decision to vote for the person yes. in your party. Now, yeah. this is as true. Now, of course, Trump is, is uh, 
is, you know, sort of the the most obviously belligerent figure on the American political scene today. But this is as true of the Republicans as it is of the Democrats. It's as true of the Democrats as it is of the Republicans. This, I think, mm. is a fascinating phenomenon, and yeah. I think it's at the heart of the American political scene, and perhaps not only of the American political scene. Yeah. yeah. And it does so that increase of rivalry. Now, it, it almost... Um, if you get too deeply entrenched in the politics and the history of human civilization, it can can become overwhelmingly um, a, 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 a overwhelmingly picture. But one of the things that was suggested in the book Psychopolitics that I found beautiful and, and uh, uh, great possibilities within there is this idea that instead of continually externalizing our own issues, instead of continually projecting our own guilt and blame onto it's to have a party, it's to have a nation, to, as long as it's outside of our borders, if we can start identifying weaknesses or an enemy even within ourselves when you overcome a weakness you have not produced a scapegoat <laughs> when you overcome um, when there's improvement in your your own way of living you can actually within yourself unite against the kind of things that produces negative effects in your relationships and in your life and in the process of identi identifying those entities as enemies instead of another person, another party, etc., you're creating a very positive environment in, in which you can still have conflict but without producing um, scapegoats. So, yes, I mean, I think this is a central idea that Jean yeah. Michel had, and it's central to this book, Psychopolitics. Yeah. And I think it's a wonderful twist on the idea of politics as the identification of the enemy. You turn yes. it around and you say, well, uh, we've seen the enemy and it is ourselves. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, but this, this brings me to a distinction that I think is somewhat significant. The distinction between hiring someone and electing someone. Yeah. When you hire someone, you look at their CV, you see if their qualifications objectively match yes. uh, the tasks that you need to be performed. And mm. you hire the person if there's a good match. Yes. That's not necessarily true when you elect somebody. Mm -hmm. There's a different relationship between the person you're electing and yourself yes. than there is between the person you're hiring and yourself. Yeah. Um, somehow you want to see yourself in the person you're electing. That person becomes a kind of champion. Yeah. Now, this I think is connected to the idea of the leader. Yeah. You elect somebody who's actually going to become a model for yeah. your entire community. Yeah. Now, traditionally, the political leaders primary function was to designate yeah. the enemy yes. and then to declare war and he had the power and still has the power to decide uh, when and for what purpose and against whom uh, the members of his community could be asked to sacrifice their lives. Mm. But in this book Psychopolitics, Jean-Michel suggests, well suppose there were a different kind of leader, a leader who continued to designate the enemy but who was a kind of sage and he gives some examples of great leaders like Martin Luther King, Mandela, uh, the Dalai Lama, who instead of uh, asking their, their citizens to go off to war and to sacrifice their lives, invited them to go down a path of self-discovery and transformation. Wonderful. Wow. That is, uh, that is a huge transformation. I think if we can involve more people in that kind of conversation um, the effects can only be positive present a different possibility a different yeah. way of thinking um, i think that yeah. would be hugely beneficial yeah. sure. there, there's so much that we can chat about still <laughs> but thank you so much for the time today and the, just the conversations we had since this morning um, yeah. it, it is just such a rare thing to, to find meaningful conversation and um, we, we've loved every minute of it. Uh, same here. Thank Enjoy you. it very Thank much. You, Thank you, Trevor.